Well, happy Father's Day to all of our dads in the house. We're here to celebrate you today. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for your families being here. Thank you for each of you being here. I'm Danny, the campus pastor here at our Banks Mill location. And I have the opportunity to share God's word with you today. I'm excited about that. But I do want to say to all of our dads, just thank you. Thanks for loving us. Thank you for caring about us. Thanks for providing for us. And I pray that you have a fantastic day today and get to kick back and enjoy, watch TV, take a nap, whatever you want to do today. So enjoy your day. Also want to tell you as you leave today, be sure you stop by one of the tables on either end of the foyer. We have a little something there for you as you exit that you will enjoy after lunch, or maybe you're like me, you're going to eat it before lunch, but just a little gift for you uh, to say happy Father's Day. But again, happy Father's Day to all of our dads. So glad that you are here and so glad that you make our lives much richer. So thank you for that. Also want to say this, I know for everybody, Father's Day may not be a great day for you. Maybe it's because this is the first Father's Day that you have not had your father here, so today's going to be a pretty hard day for you. Maybe for some of you, um, your dad wasn't around at all at any point. Uh, Maybe he passed away early. Maybe um, there was a divorce situation and he just wasn't there. Maybe he left later in life. But I just want you to know this. We understand that and get that, and I want you to know how much I appreciate you being here today and making it a point to be here today, even during a difficult day like today. And my hope and my prayer is through worship, through God's Word, that you're encouraged today and that God just helps you push through today. And thankfully, He is our perfect Heavenly Father. No matter what your Father looks like, there's no doubt out there like Jesus. And so I'm grateful that He's our Father today. I also want to say this to you. Um, Sometimes I think that people are under the impression falsely that pastors have their life all put together. And one of the reasons I like this church so much is because this is a church that's okay to not be okay. That's not only for you, but that's for us as pastors. And from the time this church opened its doors, this has been a place messed up people can come and you can join messed up people and we'll do this thing called life together and we'll just stumble closer and closer to Jesus one step at a time. And I say that to you today because the message I'm going to share is part of our warrior sermon series and and we really are looking at how to become a defender of God's kingdom of the faith. Um, and specifically kind of looking at what a man looks like, but at the same time trying to understand the things I'm going to share today apply to all of us. And I say that today as kind of a disclaimer to tell you, um, you're not looking at someone standing here speaking today that has everything we're going to talk about today, much less any time I have opportunity to speak or anybody that stands here to speak. We speak what God's Word teaches, and sometimes we do well with that, and sometimes we struggle with it. And we're tempted and we have our ups and downs and we have our faults like everybody else. So I want you to understand as I share some um, challenging truths today, I'm saying it to us. And I want you to know this. I've spent a lot of time on this message and have gotten kind of beat up over it. So whatever I share with you today, I just want you to feel the agony with me a little bit. I'm just kidding. But I just want you to understand that I'm, I'm struggling with some of this stuff too. And if my daughter were up here right now, Brooke were sharing with you, she would say to you, my dad does some of this stuff well, and my dad needs to keep working in some other areas on this. So we're all in this together. I just want to challenge you as God's challenged me and hopefully helping us to become better dads, but also better wives, better believers, better followers of Jesus. So I pray today's message does that that it's an encouragement. At the same time, we're going to deal with some some serious truths from God's Word. So with that being said, we are in this warrior series and we are looking at becoming a kingdom defender. And I do want to make just a heavy statement to start with, and that is this, um, that God's plan and God's desire is that the man be head of the house, head of the home. And when that doesn't happen, uh, gentlemen, we have to understand the family breaks down. It may be in a little way, it may be in a major way, but when we don't become and we're not the spiritual leaders that God's created us to be, our families suffer. Our spouse suffers, our kids suffer, uh, and, and it's, it's a struggle when we're not doing what we need to. So I want to say that up front, that I, I challenge you to listen closely to this message, gentlemen. But again, there's going to be things throughout that, that apply to all of us. So understand that as I begin to share. But let's go ahead and dive right into this very first point of, that I've entitled today's ser- um, sermon message, Making a Kingdom Difference. And the first way that we can make a kingdom difference is to take advantage of the routine. Take advantage of the routine. Let me start by reading out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, an Old Testament book of the Bible, and share some words that Moses shares. And I ask you to just listen, look on the screen, look on your Bible app as I share these with you. But God's word says this, 
Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is God alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Listen closely. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you're going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And one of the things I want you to see is Moses is basically saying to us, we need, as we go, as we go through the routines of life, and he mentions several in in that passage right there, as you are at home, as you're on the road, as you're going to bed, when you're getting up, put them on your hands, put them on your head, write them on your doorpost. He's saying in the routine of life, you need to help people in your family understand God, God's commands, God's word. And so we need to understand for ourselves today that we need to take advantage of every opportunity. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the time that you have your child that you're driving them to school when school's in session or the time you're driving them to a sports practice or the time that you're driving them to the doctor's office or to the dentist. Take advantage of those times and use those times to pour God and his word into them, to talk to them about Jesus, to let them know the God of this universe loves them and he forgives them and he's got a plan for them and he He brings hope to and take advantage of those opportunities in the car or take advantage of the disappointments that come in our lives. When that child's going through a disappointment, instead of having a pity party with them, stop and sit down and talk to them about the fact that God's with you and he's watching over you and he's there for you and he's going to get you through this, whether you understand it or not, that he's there and remind them of that. Or when you are seeing a sunrise or a sunset and the beauty that either of those can create for us and remind them, you know what? The God of this universe put that up there for you to enjoy and he put it up there for you to enjoy because he loves you that much and he wants you to enjoy life. Or maybe something as simple as a bedtime prayer, a bedtime song, or getting up in the morning praying with your child before their feet hit the floor. But setting that day off focused on Jesus And just taking advantage of all those opportunities that God gives us in life. One of the things I realized with a daughter that's 24 years old is life is fast. And people told me this all along. And I was in youth ministry for 20 years and I knew how fast that children grow up. But it's amazing to me when it's your own child, you have them in your arms at the hospital and they're so young and so small and you feel like, gosh, I've got them for the next 18, 19 years in my home. This is an eternity. And the next thing you know, you turn around and boom, they're gone. So we've got to take advantage of the routines that happen in life. And here's the deal. In order to take advantage of the routine, and listen to me closely on this, you have to be together. In order to take advantage of the routine, you have to be together. And why do I say that? I know sometimes we talk about the fact that quality time is more important than quantity of time. And what I would tell you is quality time is important, but I'll also tell you this. Quantity of time is extremely, extremely important. And if you don't believe me, I'll illustrate it this way to you. You look at how you spend your time, and I will tell you what's important to you. Where you spend your time tells me a lot. One of my biggest aggravations is to go to a restaurant and sit down and watch a family sitting there. Nobody looks up. They have their telephones, and dad's just sitting there the whole time just on that telephone. The whole, doesn't even know what's going on. Mom's trying to calm the kids, keep them at peace. Dad's on there checking stocks, looking at sports scores, doing whatever he's doing on that phone. And his phone is his God while they're sitting there having that meal, not taking advantage of the routine. Or I think about something as simple as a hobby. Um, And I'm really not picking on those of you who love golf because I enjoy golf. But I'm going to go years back. I'm going to share a little story with you. When I was in Columbia, um, I had an opportunity to um, be a member absolutely free of two country clubs in Columbia, Wood Creek Farms and Wood and. um, and I can't remember the other one out, just left me. Anyway, and so I was so excited about it. We got this, and I, it was a full membership. So we had the pool, we had eating, we had golf, everything else. And I'll never forget, um, because I worked Sunday through Thursday, and my daughter was in school on Friday, my primary day with her was on Saturday. And I'll never forget, that also was the day that I could play golf. And I'll just remember the struggle. This is like it's happening right now, flashing back to this, of how it would take about four to four and a half hours to play a round of golf. 
And I started thinking to myself, for me, at that stage in my child's life, I started thinking, you know what? I don't want to spend half of my Saturday by myself or with my buddies or whatever else on a golf course, and my daughter and my wife are at home. So in the two and a half years that I had that free membership, I probably played golf 10 times, maybe 10 times. Now I wish I had that free golf membership because that'd be a pretty good golfer. But back then, I ended up just letting it go because I thought, you know what? There's a routine. There's a, I want to be there for my daughter. I want quantity of time with her, not just quality, and I don't want it to be spent on a golf course. And again, please understand, I'm not indicting you if that's what you want to do. That's great, and you may find other ways to spend time with your children. But for me at that point, the quantity of time was important, and that was taken away from it. Or it could be a job. You know, I'll tell you, I dislike a lot of things about the culture that we live in. And I cannot stand the fact that we live in a culture that people feel like you have to work 50 and 60 and 70 and 80 hours. Because what I've observed in 25 years of ministry, the one area that suffers the most when a man or a woman works 60, 70, 80 hours a week is the family. Because they're going to get their rest, they've got to eat, they're going to have their hobbies and stuff, but typically it's the family that suffers most. And I think about the quantity of time that a lot of times we've created to have to be at work to provide this lifestyle that maybe could, could wait a little while because of possessions we have or the house we want to live in or whatever else. So we have to work all these hours to make it work when maybe God's saying simplify you don't have to have all this stuff. Make this simple. Have the quantity and quality of time with your family. So I don't know where you are in that, but what I just want you to know is that quantity matters greatly. And it is important that you are there as much as you can be for your children. In this box right here are 168 ping pong balls. And they represent the number of hours in any typical week. I don't know, and you probably can't see them. There's two colored balls in here. There's a blue one that's right here and a pink one that's kind of buried in here. And the reason why I brought this up to show you this is I want you to understand that a typical child spends two hours of their week at church, okay? And that would be represented by the colored balls in there. One you can see, one you can't. Then I want you to notice all the other balls that are in this container. These are hours that they're not at church. Many of these hours they're sleeping. Some of these hours they're in school. But many of these hours are spent with mom and dad. And what I want to say to you is these routine hours right here, God's word tells us in Deuteronomy to pour into your children, to let them know what's important, to let them know the commands of God, to let them know what God's word says, and to pour that into them. And again, we have a great Kids Creek team here. They do a fantastic job. But if you want those two hours here that they spend here to shape the other 166 hours of the week, it's not going to happen. Most of that shaping is going to come from you as a parent. So I want you to just understand the importance of that routine and pouring into your children. I also want to say this to you. Um, this morning, I, I'm speaking to, to dads, primarily to moms as well. But maybe you're sitting there thinking, you know what, Danny? My kids are out of the house. Or maybe you're thinking, I don't even have kids, so why are you telling me this? A couple things I'll tell you this morning. One is this. If you have kids and they're grown, one of the things I want to tell you is this. It's never too late to take care of the routine. About two years ago, I shared with you, um, standing right here, that my relationship with my birth father was very, very strained. Uh, we seldom talked. We'd see each other maybe once a year at Christmas. And I was asking you to pray for me, and I was praying, and God, how can I begin to strengthen this relationship and shortly after that, God just in his own way answered that prayer. My dad and I began to talk more and more, and my siblings began to talk with my dad more and more. And now we talk a couple, three times a month. We get together more often, more frequently. We spend more time together. And I just stop and I think about it, and, and, and my birth father probably doesn't even think about it this way, but he didn't have a pity party. And he wasn't like, you know what, I messed up back there and I, I should have done a better job with my children. But instead what he did is he realized also like we were, we got to work on this, we got to improve this. And so he did that. And so I would say to you, if this is an area that you've struggled with and, and just getting in that routine, taking advantage of it, and you feel like my kids are gone, I've blown it, you haven't. Pick up the telephone, send a text message, send an email, invite them to come to your house and begin to work on that and begin to pour into them right now. Because what I know is this, the God we serve is not a God of regrets, okay? He wants us to learn and to grow and we have to live with consequences sometimes of what's happened in our past, but he's a God of now and moving forward and giving us a hope and a future and peace. And so what I'm telling you is even if that relationship's messed up, don't give up on it. 
Take advantage of the routine. And as those routine times come up, reach out to that person. Reach out to that child that you're struggling with. And then I would also say this, if you don't have children at all, I would encourage you just to do what these verses tell us to do right here. Verses five and six are really pretty simple. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your mind. You must also commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. So what I would tell you is this, no matter child or not, take advantage of the routine and make sure your routine is including pouring God's word into your life and loving him with all that you are and letting the commands of his word become a part of your life and living like he wants to. Because his passion is that we use those routines as a way to honor him, to please him, to grow, to help other people as well. So use those routines whether you have children or not. So the first thing in making the kingdom difference, take advantage of the routine. Let's go to number two, lead like Jesus. Lead like Jesus. What am I talking about? I'm so glad you asked and I have a great answer in God's word in Philippians chapter two, verses five through eight. Listen to what God's word says. He tells us this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Listen to that again. Though he was God, he didn't think with the quality with God was something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave. This is Jesus here. And he was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. So here we have Jesus, the Son of God, an equal to God who came to this earth and didn't focus on that part. What he focused on was being a slave, being a servant to the people on this earth. Pretty amazing to me. And so what would I challenge you to do today is to have that same attitude, to be a servant, to be a slave, to humble yourself, not to look at any kind of position or power, but to humble yourself and simply serve wherever God places you and puts you. Now I'm going to go on a little bit of a rabbit chase. Uh, it's really not, but I want you to listen for just a second because in the home is where the attitude of Jesus begins, okay? And the relationship with the spouse is the very beginning point of this. And this is the part of the message I'm just going to tell you is, is um, you may be a little uncomfortable, guys. I'm just going to tell you up front and dads on this piece of this and husbands because this is where God uh, really challenged me. And at times I do well with this and at times I don't. But I want you to understand God's called us to be servants. Listen to this. Ephesians 5, verses 25 and 26. And again, if you get upset today, you need to pray and you need to talk to God about this, okay? Because I'm simply going to share with you what God's word says, okay? He says this, for husbands... Love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of the word. Now, let's talk about that for just a second. As husbands, we're given very clear directions on how we're to love our wives. We're to love our, our wives like Christ loved the church. And here's what that means to me. That first of all, Christ loved the church with an unconditional love. Okay? It did not matter what anybody else in that church, and the church, understand, is us. It's not a building. But he loved the church. He loves us unconditionally, which means it doesn't matter what he gets back. He loves the church unconditionally. We're told to love our wives as Christ loves the church. That love is to be an unconditional love. Okay? Doesn't matter what you get back, right or wrong. I'm telling you what God's Word says. We're to love our wives. He also says, and, and this means to me, that I need to be a forgiver. And when my wife messes up and comes to me and asks for forgiveness, I really don't have a choice. I've got to forgive her when she asks me to forgive her. Or um, the whole idea of just simply serving her. I've been called to serve my wife, whatever that looks like. And we're going to talk about what that looks like in just a second. But it also means that my wife is a priority. It also means my wife is someone that I minister to. And I want to say this and listen to me very closely. This has nothing to do, husbands, with what you get back. Listen to me again. This has nothing to do with what you get back. That is not what God's word says right here. And Jesus loved the church so much and served the church so much, and he oftentimes got nothing back from us. We went our own way. We do our own thing. We live our own way. He doesn't put a condition on that. He says that we are to love our wives like Christ loved the church, and that is with an unconditional servant kind of love. So what I would say to you is this. And I'm going to make this really practical for just a second. 
for many husbands, and it's something that I, I see and I observe and I listen to a lot, is that when you come home from work at the end of the day, your job is not over. Quite honestly, your primary job is just starting because your primary job is that spouse and your family. Now, let me take that a little step further. I would want you to understand and get that when you come in and you begin to focus on them and do what they need to, that's time to roll up your sleeves and get ready to go to work. Because oftentimes, and again, I don't, I'm not trying to be chauvinistic or anything else, but I know a lot of times husbands are the ones out of the house working and they've been working hard. They come in, appreciate very much what they do, but you also have a spouse there that's been working with kids all day, running all over the place, exhausted. And we're not called to walk in the door. That's not what this verse says, to take our shoes off, sit in a recliner and have the newspaper handed to us or the TV turned on to us and a beverage brought to us. It doesn't say that. What that means to me is that when a husband walks in the door, the sleeves go up and it's, honey, what do I need to do for you? Or there's a trash can heap in there that needs to go out. There's kids that need a bath. There's dishes that need to be washed. The list goes on and on and on. And am I crazy enough to think what God's saying here is that as husbands, that's how we need to serve our wives? Absolutely, I think that. It's not about us. It's about them at this point. It's about modeling what Jesus did, and he did everything he could to love and serve the church. And we're called to do the same thing for our spouse, to love them that same way. And here's what I'm confident of. If Jesus were married, okay, and I don't mean to be going crazy or anything else, but I'm pretty sure when he came in the door from a day's work, he wouldn't have laid his sandals by the door and walked in and sat down on the dirt floor and looked at his wife and said, okay, I'm home now. I'm ready for you and the kids to serve me. I have a hard time thinking that. I think he would take his robe and tuck it in the cord wrapped around his waist, and he would dive right in and help his spouse do whatever needed to be done. But here's the crazy thing, and I, I forgot to mention this first service, and I think this is important. And not that we do it for this reason, but Scripture tells us very clearly that a wife is supposed to submit to her husband. And anytime I'm in pre-marriage counseling, I see the life drained out of a wife's face when we talk about this. But I emphasize this verse, and I emphasize to them, if a husband loves his wife like Christ loves the church, I can assure you that most ladies won't have a problem at all following the leadership of her husband. They will jump on board with that in a minute because they're reflecting Christ and that spouse knows my husband loves me more than anything else and he will do anything at his own sacrifice for me because he loves me and I'm not important to him. So I would just say to you today, husbands, that's how we need to love our wives. Is it hard? Is it difficult? Yes. Does God have to help us do that? Yes, but it's how God set it up. And again, I cannot get away from the fact that this scripture passage says we're to love our wives like Christ loves the church, and that is the ultimate sacrifice. So that being said, um, let me move on to this. Or actually, let me take just a second and talk to him for a minute about how this relates to the whole idea of children and this whole idea of leading like Jesus did. And that is going to be over in uh, verse 4 of Ephesians. God says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Some great, great advice here. Discipline and instruction, that's how we're to raise our children. Sometimes I'm guilty of thinking this idea of discipline is only punishment. And it can involve correcting, absolutely. But that idea of discipline carries the idea of this. Listen, it actually means to nurture, to educate the mind, to bring morals, instruction, and correcting is what that word actually means. So it's so much more than just discipline. It's actually being able to teach and train and educate our children and create morals in their life and, and them focusing on Jesus in their life. And that's what we're called to do, to teach and to discipline that way. And then he goes on to talk about this whole idea of instruction. And as I really began to dig down into this verse and look at the original meaning in the Greek, that word instruction means to put into the mind what comes from God. So as a dad, we're to be pouring into our children the things of God and pouring into their mind and into their life the things of God so that they can begin to live that out and understand what faith in Jesus is all about. 
So this is, this is really, really important that dads understand this is what we're called to do, to raise them with discipline and instruction that comes from God. We don't have to create this. We don't have to figure out what to teach and do with them. God will show us what that is, but we need to be pouring that into them at all times. And we need to understand that our responsibility is to lead our families and not to do it with an iron fist or with some kind of heavy hand, but to do it in love and in service and in passion for our family and not to allow this responsibility, as it so often does, to fall back on mom. And mom has to do all this. No, dads, we're called to do this. So again, if your children are grown or you don't have children, what does all this mean for you as I've shared this point, to lead like Jesus? I just take you back to Philippians chapter 2. And that's really the, the heart of what I would say to you is that you, whether you have children or not, you are absolutely called to live a life like Jesus and to be that slave, to be that servant to other people to allow God to show you, teach you, and help you know how you need to relate to other people and realize it's not about you anymore. It's about what God wants to do through you in other people's lives and to serve them and to allow God to use you to make an impact in their life. So to make a a kingdom difference, we need to take advantage of the routine. We need to live live like Jesus. The third thing we need to do is introduce our children to Jesus. Let me ask you this. Who have you introduced your children to? Think with me for a minute. And you may have done this without even thinking about it. But a lot of us have introduced our children to cartoons. We'll sit them down. Maybe it's for babysitting. Maybe we need a minute of freedom or whatever else. And so they start watching cartoons and they're introduced to a cartoon. Or maybe they're introduced, and I don't know a lot of these anymore because my daughter's older, but to some kind of of child musician, Jojo Siwa. I don't know, just go through the list of different people. And you put your child down in there, and they're introduced to that person, and they begin to sing the songs, and they know all those lyrics and everything else of that person. Or maybe it's a hobby you introduce them to, golf, tennis, piano, I mean, you name it. You're introducing them to a hobby. Great thing, not a problem at all. Maybe you introduce them to digital media. I'm always amazed when I see a child sitting in a waiting room that picks up a magazine and they open it and all of a sudden you start seeing them try to to scroll across the page or widen their fingers to get it bigger or whatever else because they're not used to magazines. They're used to digital media. And a lot of times we'll use that as ways to either keep them calm or distract them for a minute. But we introduce them to all of those things. But let me ask you this. Do we introduce them to Jesus? Do we introduce them to Jesus? If you think about that, that's the most important relationship with the greatest consequence of any decision they'll ever make because that's an eternal decision they'll make with Jesus. They'll either accept him to forgive them of their sin and give them life or they'll choose to reject him and spend eternity separated from him. That's a pretty important decision. And do we take time, especially dads, of introducing our child to Jesus? And that will often come in the routines that I talked about in point one. Let me illustrate this for you over in the book of Mark. And this is going to be Mark chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. And I want you to listen to this very first first verse especially. And this is what God's word says. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples, and he said to them, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I don't know if you picked it up. Very first verse, they brought their children to Jesus. They introduced their children to Jesus. And Jesus scolded his disciples when they basically were saying, he's too busy. There's other things happening, other more important things happening. Jesus says, no, there's not. They need to come to me right now while they're children. And this is such a critical age for people to know Jesus as children. And to, to, we know from statistics that percentage drops the older and older kids get. They seem to be more and more independent, doing things their own way, living their own life, and Jesus is not even part of their thought. So it's important that we capture them when they're young, but you'll see here, his, Jesus is saying, no, bring them to me. And the parents were bringing them and introducing them to Jesus. Let me illustrate this to you for a minute. I enjoyed at one point in my life running. I don't enjoy it too much anymore, as you can look at me and tell. But I love to watch track and field. And the last couple of weeks, I've been watching the NCAA National Championships. And one of the events I love is any event that has to do with a baton, a relay. And so for sake of what I want to share with you for a minute, I want you to just take the 4 by 100 relay for a second, where four men or women have to pass a baton to one another as they're racing around the track. 
And one of the things I know from watching them is the baton pass is critical. It can make or break a race. It can win a race. It can lose a race. I also know that you only have a certain span. I think it's about 20 meters that that baton can be passed. And once you get outside of that 20 meters, if you pass it, doesn't matter. You're disqualified. It has to be in that particular zone. And so each of those athletes will run around the track. As they get close, they'll reach out. They'll place the baton in their teammate's hand within that 20 meters, and boom. Then that person's gone, and that happens again until there's a winner, until the race is over. Let me apply that to what I'm talking about today. I want you to suppose for a minute that the gospel, the message of Jesus, forgiveness, his love, the hope he provides, the eternal life he provides, that good news of Jesus is a baton. Someone handed you the baton at some point if you are a Christ follower and you took that baton and now you're running with it. If you're a parent, and again, I'm going to speak to dads because we're on Father's Day today, you have that baton in your hand and you have a responsibility to pass that baton to your child that's behind you. And so you've got to take advantage of the routine and you've got to lead like Jesus and you've got to get ready to introduce them to Jesus by passing that baton. And by passing your faith on to them, a faith that they're going to ultimately have to decide on their own, but at least have the grounds to know they need Jesus because they're sinful and broken and they need God to forgive them. And so you need to pass that baton to them. A couple things. A lot of times we wait around too long and we fumble with that baton and we don't ever pass it along to them for whatever reason. It's not convenient. They wouldn't listen to me. It's too hard. It's too awkward to talk to them about that. And we never make that pass of our faith to them for whatever reason. Or what we do is we think we have forever to do it, and we don't. Again, that athlete has about a 20-meter section of track. They can pass that off. You and I don't have forever. We like to think we do, but our kids are growing, and they're getting older and older and older, and chances and opportunities for God to work and, and use you to plant seeds in their life, those are passing by very rapidly, very, very quickly. I hate to even say it. Some people don't even get a chance to see their children get out of childhood because they, they pass away. And my question to you is, are you passing that baton to them? Are you passing the baton of faith to them? Are you introducing them to Jesus? Or for whatever reason, are you hanging on to that? For whatever reason, you're not passing it. And I want to challenge you today to be willing to pass that baton to them and realize that it it is on a time schedule, that their hearts will naturally get harder and harder and harder the older they go if you even have that time to pour into them. So take advantage of passing that baton, introducing them to Jesus. And again, I want to speak to those that maybe don't have children or maybe um, you feel like this is an area where you blew it. I'll just tell you this. God wants to use every single one of us to introduce others to Jesus. That's his passion in his heart. The mission of Cedar Creek Church, we are all called to be reconcilers to God. We're to help people find their way back to God. It's what drives everything we do here at Cedar Creek Church is trying to help people, other people, the next person know that they need Jesus. And so what I would say to you is that applies to your life. If you've got kids, pour into them, introduce them to Jesus. If you don't have them, look, look for the people God's put in your life, a neighbor, a friend, a family member, a coworker, and know that God wants you to introduce them to Jesus and he's planted you there for a reason and for a purpose and he wants you to introduce them to him. So very important that we, first of all, take advantage of the routines. Second, that we lead like Jesus. Third, that we introduce our children to Jesus. And then the last one, is to live a legacy, or to leave a legacy, rather, to leave a legacy. And here's the deal. You're going to leave a legacy. You will choose if it's a good legacy or a bad legacy. This past weekend, two different funerals. Thank the good Lord I got to sit back and watch family members and friends come up and share the legacy that their two loved ones had left with tears in their eyes, watching the family on that front pew, tears in their eyes, just remembering what this person had poured into their life and into their family. That's God's desire is that we leave that type of legacy, but we will choose the legacy that we leave. I want to share three stories with you of three different men and then the three different memories that happen as a result of that. So real quickly, let me share these. The first is a man named Liam Gallagher. If you are familiar with British music, you may know that he is part of the group Oasis. I have no idea who that is. But anyway, he was physically and verbally abused by his dad. He actually watched his dad hit his mom over and over with a hammer at one point and just observed abuse over and over and over again. And he admits the effect it had on him caused him to this day to stop believing in God altogether. He just never understood how God would allow him to be in that situation to watch this abuse and to receive this abuse over and over again. 
There's another man named Cal Thomas. Cal is a syndicated columnist. He's also a very vocal believer. And his thoughts on his dad go like this. What he did for a living was not the most important thing in my life because it didn't seem to be the most important thing in his life. I do remember the Lionel train set he bought me one Christmas. I still have it and would never sell it at any price. I'll never forget the hours he spent with me setting it up and watching the joy on my face as it raced around the track. I remember the backyard games of catch and the movies he took me to when they were worth watching. None of the things I remember about my father had anything at all to do with his lifestyle, whom he knew, or the places that, that he had been. Just one second here. <clears throat> there we go. Um, no one will ever know. Uh, excuse me. Nope. Let me see where I'm going. Sorry about that. There he is. There it is. Um, and he, so he never talked about anything. He didn't talk about the style of clothes that he wore or anything. I just knew that my dad was always there. And then the third one is a gentleman named Lawrence Bridge. He was a missions pastor at a local church, a busy man with an extremely important career. And when his family wrote his obituary for the papers, they chose to remember him this way. Larry's, um, Larry's hobbies included Bible study, spending time with children, and leading his family in a relationship with the Lord. Now here's what's interesting. Cal carries a picture of his father in his briefcase, a constant reminder of the joy that his, bro that his father brought to his childhood. On the other hand, Liam Gallagher carries bitterness and resentment, and he actually said this, if he died tomorrow, I wouldn't go to his funeral. How sad is that? I wouldn't even go to his funeral when my dad died. Here's the deal. We all are leaving a legacy. Uh, what is yours? What, how would your story fit into there? What is your legacy? How are things going to end for you? How will people remember you? How will your children remember you? Are you leaving the legacy that you want to leave? And let me leave you with just several thoughts. Dads, as we get older and we take personal inventory, very few of us will express regret that we should have worked more hours, made more money, or went further in our careers. Many will say, I wish I would have spent more time working on my marriage, a few more hours spent with my kids during their formative, during their formative years. No one will ever know whether you could have worked a few more hours or earned a few more dollars, but your wife and your kids will care deeply if they feel neglected. You'll always have work. You won't always have the kids running in and out of your house, leaving the garage door open, leaving that pile of shoes in the middle of the living room floor or their muddy hunting boots a size smaller than yours at the back door. What I would say to you this morning is you only have one life and they only have one childhood. What is it that you're doing with that? And don't mess either of those up. And again, I want to tell you today, if you feel like you have messed it up and you feel like you haven't been there for your children like you should have been, ask for forgiveness and then move on. Don't, please, 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 don't sit there in a pity party. That doesn't do anything. Ask God to help you forgive yourself and help him, ask him to help you figure out how you move forward and you begin to pour into them and allow them to see your love for them and allow them to see Jesus reflected through you because I know God will use you if you'll do that. And again, if your children are grown or you, don't have, or you don't have children at all, I would tell you, you too are going to leave a legacy. The people around you, your coworkers, your family, your friends, you're leaving a legacy every day. And what do you want that to look like? Because now is the time to decide that. The deathbed, that's too late to decide. Uh, that you can't do anything about it at that point. You're making and building that legacy right now. And so I would encourage you to focus on that. So this morning, I'm making a kingdom difference. Dads, and really to all of us, take advantage of the routine. Lead like Jesus leads. Introduce people to Jesus and leave a legacy that points people to the God that loves them and is passionate about them and leave a legacy that lets other people know they're valuable and they're important and you value them. Would you pray with me? Father, I want to come to you and thank you for our time today. Father, I thank you for your word. And Father, sometimes your word challenges us in ways that, that aren't fun and aren't easy. But I thank you that you challenge us. And today I have really felt like that's been kind of where we are, that it's not been a fun, a light message. It's been challenging. It's been areas that maybe we don't live like we should live. And, and maybe we've even been defeated and we haven't done a good job leading in those areas. But I want to thank you that you're a God of, of many, many chances, a God of forgiveness. And you'll use us right where we are if we'll simply cry out to you and seek that forgiveness and seek God. What's that next step for me to take? And I know that you can bring healing and I know that you can do amazing, miraculous things 
things as we surrender to you. So give us the boldness and courage just to surrender the good, to surrender the tough things in our life, and just to allow you to use us. Father, I also pray this morning for the person sitting here uh, that doesn't know you as their father. And I know there's nothing else, there's nothing else more important to you than having a relationship with each person in this room and each person that's online with us this morning. Father, you're so passionate about that relationship. Your word tells us that you're waiting to return, that one more person would join you as your son or your daughter through your son, Jesus Christ. So I pray for that person this morning that if they don't know you personally, they'll find a Christ follower to talk to them about how to begin that journey. They'll talk to one of our prayer encouragers. They'll stop by VIP. That they'll reach out to figure out how they can begin that relationship of you being their dad and understanding forgiveness and hope and direction and peace and purpose. So give them that boldness and courage to do that. But this morning, I want to thank you that you are our perfect father. No matter what our father like was on the, what was like on this earth, you are the perfect father. And I pray that we would draw close to you. I pray that we would look to you. I pray that we would learn more about you through your word, through prayer, through being in church, being in Bible study, Father. I pray we draw closer to you, the ultimate father, and really learn what love looks like and service looks like and just enjoy being your son or your daughter. So thank you that you would love us enough to call us to do that, to have a passion for that. And this morning, I just thank you for your amazing, unconditional love for each of us broken, sinful people. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.